my name is Dave McIntosh. I'm really, really excited to be here today and, and present and help present this uh, really important update. Um, as we're getting started, I want to just uh, acknowledge the, the team that has worked so hard on all of this work and has worked really hard on today. Um, uh, Erica Beth is one of our co-senior advisors. Uh, Clarence Braddock is, of course, our executive vice dean and the original executive director of this initiative. Julian McNeil is our original project manager for this initiative and now director of JEDI. Abir Nasir is our um, current project manager for this work. Leika Rao is our other co-senior uh, advisor to this work. And Dana Schmitz is our Swiss Army knife and special advisor and closer on all things ARR and otherwise. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all so much for your work. You're going to get to hear from each of them through the course of today's presentation. What we're going to do here today is we are going to give a really good and nice welcome uh, by understanding the history of ARR, how we got here and what the structure is. We're going to talk about future sessions that we're that we're going to host in order to understand where we're going. We're going to talk about some of the grassroots initiatives and talk about how you can get involved. And then we're going to look ahead. What, what is it that we can do to make ARR um, alive and well and, and take the next steps into the future? Of course, we'll have some Q&A at the end. With that, it's my distinct pleasure to turn it over to our good friends and colleagues, Dr. Bath and Dr. Braddock. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dean McIntosh, uh, and welcome everyone. It's so nice to have you all here. Uh, as uh, uh, Vice Dean McIntosh said, we're going to really start by just briefly summarizing what the anti-racism roadmap is, uh, where it came from, and some of the highlights of our work to date. Um, for those of you that don't know me, <clears throat> I'm Executive Vice Dean and Vice Dean for Education here at the David Geffen School of Medicine. I've been here since 2013. <clears throat> I'm not going to summarize uh, uh, the history to uh, the summer of 2020, but my work in education, including seeking to create a diverse uh, and inclusive uh, medical school class and environment to seek and, and promote diversity and inclusion in all aspects of other parts of our education program, residency uh, and fellowship, uh, graduate education and others, uh, I, I was very much a, a, a proud to be a member of the community trying to advance, <coughs> excuse me, equity, diversity, inclusion uh, before the events of the summer of 2020. But I'll start the story there. <clears throat> Many of you, of course, will recall the extraordinary times in which we found ourselves in the spring and summer of 2020, uh, facing a, uh, the, the first part of the, of the pandemic, the global pandemic of COVID-19 that created incredible disruptions in all aspects of society and all aspects of our work, research, education, <clears throat> community engagement, and clinical care, and was just destabilizing in ways that we still uh, experience today. In the midst of that pandemic, you will also remember the tragic events uh, that summer uh, where we all witnessed uh, in streaming video uh, the horrific murder of George Floyd at the hands of police uh, in Minnesota. Now it's important to, to say, like any one of us thinking about the history of that time, that you know George Floyd's murder was not the first time, nor was it the last, unfortunately, that a, a, a person of color died in the hands of police or died at the hands of uh, racially motivated uh, violence. What was it about George Floyd's murder that, that catalyzed and prompted action? I think we can all reflect on that. Uh, there certainly was some sense uh, not just at DGSOM, not just at UCLA, not just in California, the United States, but but everyone who bore a witness to that felt that some that some pivotal moment had happened that catalyzed the need for serious action. The action that took place that summer uh, are, was, was the beginning of a much more serious commitment to anti-racism, to racial justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, some of which happened from the leadership, and I'll talk about the part from the dean's office, and my and my colleague and 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 uh, you know partner in this work, uh, Dr. Erica Bath, who needs no introduction to this group, uh, but really helped lead the the, the community uh, of our faculty, uh, staff, and trainees in bringing their voice to the origins of the anti-racism roadmap. So um, shortly after the murder of George Floyd, uh, one of the things we realized was that we. The university as a, as a campus and a school of medicine in particular was relatively slow to respond, to acknowledge the events that we had all witnessed and to make statements to 
decry those actions at the hands of police and re reaffirm our commitment to accountability for racism and to make changes in the, in the School of Medicine and beyond. That delay was unconscionable at some level, and I think catalyzed a very serious, I would say animated discussion in the Dean's office about how we needed to take a different approach. And that approach included really listening to the voices of our community. Number two, making explicit commitments backed by, by resources. And number three, to acknowledge our complicity as an organization and as individuals in allowing racism to continue uh, even to the point of witnessing something as horrific as George Floyd's murder. Um, several things happened. Uh, I'll ask Dr. Bath to summarize some of the grassroots effort of faculty and staff and trainees bringing their voice to, the, to that time <clears throat> within the Dean's office. <clears throat> I'll say that one, one day in the aftermath of that, I sat down after talking with colleagues, talking with students, reading some of the letters, and I penned a a document uh, which was really the precursor of the anti-racist robot really it was just my own musings about not my own musings but my uh, kind of compilation of the voices that I was hearing that became the the uh, precursors of the anti-racism roadmap I'm grateful to our former dean uh, Dr. Kelsey Martin for listening and for realizing that that we and under her leadership needed to make a very verbal public and tangible commitment to work did we think we were gonna solve everything overnight? Of course not. But we, need, we knew we needed to make a significant commitment and have it be the start of a process. The roadmap as a construct really speaks to that because it's a journey. Uh, that journey needs to be marked that we can look back at the road traveled and feel like we've made progress, but also look at the road ahead and feel that, and acknowledge fully and with an open mind and heart that there's more work that lies ahead. The parts of the anti-racism roadmap that became important, I'll talk about in a second, but I'm grateful to our former uh, senior associate dean, Dr. Lynn Gordon, who championed these issues for many years in her role as a predecessor to Vice Dean McIntosh and to our JEDI committee, the, the other many, many organizations, formal and informal, that brought their voices at that time and since to help drive our organization, our school, our community to uh, to approach the vision, the aspiration to truly dismantle structural racism and to truly create a, a diverse, inclusive, uh, equitable, and just organization and culture uh, and engage in that work with our community. So with that, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna pause on the, uh, before I outline some of the major features of the anti-racism roadmap and invite uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Erica Bath, um, who's a, Senior advisor to the anti-racism roadmap. One of the initial actions was calling up Dr. Bath and asking her to join in the effort. And she was gracious and enthusiastic in doing so. She's obviously been a phenomenal leader within uh, the Department of Psychiatry, uh, emerged as a leader of the uh, of Black, Latinx, and Native American uh, faculty collective, and in many, many other ways has been a superb change agent at DGSOM and beyond. So Dr. Bath. Thank you, Clarence, uh, for that really kind introduction. Um, I just wanted to highlight the ways in which the people united can't be defeated. And one of the things that was so critical in this moment in the summer of 2020 were all the different constituent groups that found each other and got together. Many were newly formed, um, like the Black, Latinx, Native American Faculty Collective, Prior to uh, the summer of 2020, there hadn't really been an organized space for uh, some of our URM faculty to convene and share ideas. People didn't even necessarily know each other. And one of the things that was clear was that there was shared pain and consensus. And we were also seeing what was happening across the country in terms of racial reckoning in various industries, not just in medicine. Um, similarly, uh, the residents uh, wrote a petition, uh, the medical students, the health equity hub, uh, different constituent groups, and really um, asked uh, leadership to engage in dialogue. And so I think there's lessons to be learned in the power of community as a space um, to sort of cultivate conversations. And that's part of the origin story of how the AAR got started. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Bath, and thank you for your partnership and leadership in this space. So I want to turn my uh, attention now to making a few remarks about the anti-racism roadmap. And what you see here is a, a, a graphic which shows the, the many areas, which um, uh, were the 11 focus areas for our work when the ARR, the anti-racism roadmap, was launched in August of 2020. I'm not going to go in detail uh, into each of these areas, but only offer a few highlights um, to give you a flavor. I will say that certainly during this call or afterwards, I'd invite you to visit the website, which we'll put up in just a moment, uh, where you can see uh, the uh, both, both the in more detail, the components of the anti-racism roadmap, as well as uh, track our progress uh, in these other areas. Just going back to that prior slide for a moment, I'll just give you a few highlights. Uh, for example, we wanted to make firm commitments to how do we make progress? And although we were very grateful for the work of our uh, Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, we realized we needed to ramp up those efforts. And so uh, we launched a national search for a position that became the Vice Dean for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. That search concluded uh, about a, a year later with the you know, incredible, our incredible good fortune of recruiting a true scholar and leader, uh, uh, David McIntosh, to be Vice Dean uh, for, for JEDI. Uh, we also, again, I'm grateful to Dean Martin and leadership of the school for committing $5 million uh, to uh, the, uh, the effort. That $5 million is intended to be a start. And uh, as you'll hear uh, in recent discussion, as we look at this work and since Vice Dean McIntosh has come, we realize $5 million is a start. And again, we can look at the accomplishments that that has helped us to do in the rearview mirror on this road, but also look at what we need to invest resources and our commitment on the road ahead. Uh, the <clears throat> uh, admissions and selections, we had already been on a fantastic pathway of really embracing holistic review as a construct in medical school admissions. And under the leadership of our uh, admissions dean, uh, Dr. Jennifer Lucero, we've uh, we have unprecedented levels of diversity in our medical school class. We've seen that similar effort in residency programs, in part driven by um, transparency and data and transparency. So one of the early things we did was pull data together that showed very clearly diversity in faculty, staff, and trainees uh, across programs, across departments, and across sites to really to shine a flashlight on ourselves about areas where we could do better and needed to do better in terms of recruitment and retention. Um, education and training, we, one of the other things we launched that summer was the beginning of a, uh, a, uh, a, a racial equity and social justice curricular thread for the medical school that now has a permanent place in the new medical school curriculum. And we're grateful to the many faculty who committed to that effort to really create uh, content, curricular content, and conversation and dialogue around the issues historical and contemporary around racial justice and racial equity, uh, not just in healthcare delivery, but in our broader communities. So um, we, the final thing I'll mention is that uh, the, the, the efforts that we had in the School of Medicine were not isolated. We had parallel efforts in our healthcare system to identify and recruit a chief health equity and diversity inclusion officer for UCLA Health, and that's uh, Dr. Medell Briggs Mollinson, who has been a, a fantastic and, and transformative leader and has been a, a, an incredible partner uh, between the School of Medicine and the health system at advancing our common goals, including uh, the complete revamping of mandatory training in these areas done by Vice Dean McIntosh and his team, along with Dr. Briggs Mollinson and her team. So again, I invite you, you know, either during this call or uh, at your leisure uh, to reflect on, um, as I said, what's in the rear view mirror, the, the things that we can look at with pride about our accomplishments, but also that we look at with humility and resolve to the road ahead. And I think the work that still remains undone. And today you're gonna hear more about uh, what the future looks like and how this work can be advanced. With that, I'll turn things uh, uh, back over to um, uh, to uh, uh, Vice Dean McIntosh to lead us into the next area of the program.
All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our next slide here is uh, going to be presented by uh, by our good friend, Dr. Rao. Dr. Rao? Yeah, so um, one of the things that we are highlighting here is some grassroots initiatives. And among them, um, we have not only faculty, students, but also staff who are leading these initiatives. Um, so this is an example of of a staff-led podcast circle. This was implemented by a group of chief administrative officers um, from various departments, and these were formed to engage staff in conversations about racism and anti-racism. Um, during 10 weekly sessions, participants discussed the podcast, Be Anti-Racist, um, which imagines what an anti-racist society might look like and how we can build one. Um, some of the goals included developing knowledge and skills in the pursuit of being anti-racist, creating a safe space to share, make mistakes and unlearn and relearn truths and fostering a collaborative intersectional community at DGSOM. Um, if you're interested in, in starting your own anti-racism podcast circle, um, certainly there are opportunities to do so. Um, and there's a link on the JEDI website um, in order to, to um, learn more about how to start up doing that. Another initiative um, that was started in psychiatry by one of our uh, former trainees, Dr. Ann Crawford Roberts, and supported by uh, the Psychiatry Office of JEDI and the General Residency Program was a book club. Um, and we entitled it the Anti-Racism Learning Group. And um, we used the book Me and White Supremacy by Leila Saad, um, which actually has a workbook that goes along with it divided into 30 sections. And so we had different, we had faculty, trainees and staff meet um, over a year basically to discuss the different topics, um, which included white privilege, tone policing, addressing anti-black racism, and really getting people to have an experiential arm of anti-racist learning. Uh, and I'll take it from here. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Beth. And thank you, Dr. Beth, for noting the BLC in the chat. I know we all kind of forget things. And also, thank you, Dave. I've never been referred to as a Swift Army knife, but I appreciate it. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, just on this slide, we're talking about the current common book, which I'm sure many of you know at this point. <clears throat> Excuse me, is this Some of Us by Heather McGee, which is an excellent selection, I think, for this year that uh, Dr. Braddock picked for us. And um, this common book program has been going on for about three or four years more with uh, the book selection being focused through the lens of racism and anti-racism. And so we still are doing our student-based discussions on the book for our MS1s, although we've expanded that and it's woven more into their curriculum um, with our racial equity theme and the new HEALS curriculum. We also have our staff common book discussions, which we have had for about three or four years now. And then um, as some additional notes, I know there are some departments that have started book clubs. So reach out um, to some of your leaders in your department to see if there is one. If not, if you're interested in learning more, you can email the email address in the, the um, box below. Um, if you need any help or assistance, uh, I'm happy to provide that as I lead the ones for our staff common book conversations. And with that, I will pass it back to Julian McNeil, I believe he's next. Sure, I can, I can, sorry about that, I can take it. Uh, thanks, Dana. Um, we just updated the anti-racism roadmap uh, webpage to include a link to a Qualtrics form that allows folks to share a accomplishments um, within their departments or work units um, that are related to the to the to the roadmap. Um, if you go to the anti-racism roadmap webpage, you should see what appears on the slide. And there's a little link that says note for the accomplishment submission form. Um, I'm also putting the link in the chat box now so that everyone has it. Um, if there's ever uh, work that's happening um, that's related to one of the 11 focus areas and uh, you want to tell the JEDI office about it, this is how you do it. There are just a few fields for folks to, to fill in. So name, email address, uh, the ARR focus area that 
um, the noteworthy accomplishment is related to, and then an open text box for you to describe the accomplishment. Um, and finally, another open text box for you to list any contributors to that accomplishment. Uh, we realize that our organization is big and we might not know everything that's happening uh, related to the to the roadmap. So this is once again one way for you all to keep us informed. Um, during subsequent sessions in the series, uh, you will learn about um, kind of progress to date. So we are gonna we'll talk more about this towards the end of the session, but uh, we'll have a thematic. Um, meeting series that lasts until the end of the school year and you'll learn about kind of progress in each of the 11 areas of the roadmap as well. Uh, looking ahead, I want to quickly talk about ARR refinements. Uh, when the roadmap was originally created, uh, we said that it would be a working or living document that we'd refine over time um, in order to address emerging and evolving needs within the school community. So refinements might include thematically combining or separating the 11 preliminary focus areas. Uh, for example, we've heard um, from a number of stakeholders that they're interested in having a focus area um, that addresses um, historic wrongdoings or introduces some type of truth and reconciliation process. So that's one thing that's being considered as an addition. Um, and there might be ways to, to combine other areas um, within the roadmap too. Whoops. Sorry. Um, we also are thinking about uh, the need to rewrite all of the goals as SMART goals. So goals that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Uh, our team just undertook a, a very large uh, did a very large kind of audit of the roadmap to once again capture what has happened from its inception to until today. And what we found that is that while some of the goals are super admirable, um, they're really hard to measure or track over time. Uh, so we do need to do some work to refine some of the goals so that they are more easily uh, measurable and trackable over time. And then finally, um, within the next iteration of the roadmap, we wanna make sure that we have clear accountability leads or points of contact for each focus area. With the first iteration, um, much of the accountability uh, and kind of leadership um, came out of the Dean's office and the Jedi office, uh, but we really do wanna kind of distribute some of the leadership um, and accountability for, for the different focus areas in the future. So those are just some of the things that we have in mind for refinements. Um, towards the end of this uh, academic year, we'll be sending out a call for folks to express interest in joining uh, the ARR Refinement Task Force, which will undertake the work that I just described. Uh, I wanna make it clear sometimes I think uh, people um, might say, hey, I don't have a background in Jedi or diversity, like I can't really contribute to that, but we really are looking for folks that have um, diverse skill sets. Uh, we'll need folks that have expertise in measurement, program evaluation, strategic planning, uh, in addition to anti-racist leadership in higher education, um, et cetera. At this point, um, I'm going to turn it over to, um, I think I, if you want to do this, to Abir, who will talk through the upcoming um, sessions, and then we'll open up the floor for Q&A. Hi, everyone. Um, so like Julian mentioned, what we've been doing over the last year is looking through that first version of the anti-racism roadmap. And of the 11 sections, really going through each of the original charges and the tasks and finding um, the places where we won and then also finding areas and opportunities for improvement. Um, and we'd love to share the work that we've um, identified in the last year. So this is what you're seeing up here. Um, this is a very rough timeline. If you'll notice the ARR focus areas are all divided within five sessions, starting around the new year until um, June. And we're aiming to try to do around one a month, one every six weeks. Um, and the reason for the division is some people may have certain expressed interests in some focus areas. And if you are 
thinking about joining the task force, if you're thinking about any type of contribution, um, this would be a great first place to start. Um, if you have an interest in a specific area, there is a rough, um, rough timeline from January to June. As we get through each session, uh, what we'll be doing is sending out more communications similar to the one that we had for today. Um, and it'll be the similar style where we'll try to meet on campus if possible, but also welcome um, a big Zoom audience. Um, and the whole point is just to engage as a community, to unite as a community, um, and to find areas for opportunities and improvements um, so that we can all grow together. So if you have any specific interest in any um, session, please do join. We'd love to have you there. We're also aiming to find um, operational and functional experts within each of the focus areas. So we'll be inviting guests. It's going to be a great fun time. Um, so there's a lot to look forward to after the new year. And, and now what we wanted to do is, is reserve some time for Q&A. We went through a lot of information that summarized a few years worth of work. Um, so what we want to do now is open up for Q&A, anything on the presentation, anything we may have missed um, or any interest you may have. All right. At this point, if you want to raise your hand or unmute and ask your question or put it in the chat, uh, any of those would be perfectly great. Thank you all. And thank you to all of our presenters while those questions start to come in. Um, there was a, a great deal of time and energy that went into creating this presentation and doing the background research and really making sure that we're up to date with everything that's going on with ARR. It's been a tremendous undertaking. Dave, we had a question in the chat from Lindsay. Oh, great. So, so sorry about that. Uh, Lindsay's question is for the, uh, I think it's the ARR refinement task force. Uh, she asked if we can, if she can know more about um, time and commitment. Uh, unfortunately, that is to be determined. Uh, so I can't give you uh, many details right now about time and commitment, um, but obviously it will be part-time work. And I suspect that will um, kind of outline some initial expectations for commitments and then uh, negotiate based on those that are selected to, to be on the task force. Yeah. <laughs> We're all sitting together, so we're taking turns muting and, and unmuting. Um, but for Lindsay to, to add on to Jillian's um, answer, uh, coming into the team with my project management lens, um, well, probably what I'm thinking is going to look like a, a charge letter where we will outline probably the, the time commitment um, per week, uh, commitment inside of meetings, outside of meetings, the overall timeline, um, just so that everybody is very aware of what they're signing up for. Um, and again, because it is, um, because it is, you know, probably going to be a longer term project, um, it'll probably have a very unique structure that we can work on one on one. Um, so as we get closer, I will, um, I will start outlining that once we start getting interest from people. So I'll start outlining that as we get closer to that. There is a question in the chat from Lauren who says, how can we request uh, resources and support for our specific departments and divisions needs and our efforts in being more anti-racist? Uh, we are, as of right now, and Dave, you can chime, or anyone else can chime in too, um, we've been responding to requests uh, primarily through email and by folks just like kind of reaching out to us or to the office directly. Uh, we're working on developing a system uh, which will probably be look like an online Qualtrics form um, and a web page that kind of lists some of the resources and supports that our office can provide as well as some of the resources and supports uh, within UCLA Health and UCLA at large. Um, and then there'll also there will be like a, a Qualtrics, Qualtrics form where you can submit a request online. Um, and that will allow us to keep track of uh, uh, what types of requests and uh, supports people need and then triage those things appropriately. Uh, unfortunately, that's still in development. 
but that will be something that uh, will be up on the website soon. I'd also add that each of our departments has a Jedi lead. And so that's a person who is specifically tasked with leading this sort of work at the department level. So for everybody here in the School of Medicine who's part of an academic department, you have a leader who can assist with that. And so, and if they don't have the resources, then they're, they're, they work with a whole team of people. And so we can definitely get you connected with the right resources. But perhaps as after the website and the, the Qualtrics form, another stop would be that Jedi lead. Additionally, I just wanted to chime in, Dave and Julian, well, slightly on behalf of Dr. Natalie Perry uh, for the Culture of North Star. So um, as some of you know, we'll be announcing uh, those winners for this past year and celebrating next year, um, their achievements, but they do uh, receive some small funding. So I think that is a great way to look for funding for your department is to, you know, have someone nominate those teams. And then also uh, Dr. Perry, um, um, on behalf of the Culture North Star should be announcing some more exciting developments in the new year. And I see Monique smiling because she's involved in some of that work. So just be on the lookout for any communication from Dean Dubina. And um, I would strongly encourage people to uh, pay attention and potentially apply because you could use those funds for those efforts. Thanks. I would also like to, to, to add and maybe to segue to Jay Lee's question about uh, other sources. Uh, it's a great question. Um, you know, we certainly uh, have uh, had conversations. We invited uh, uh, Lindsay Williams, who's Associate Vice Chancellor for Health Sciences Development, to attend several meetings, the uh, JEDI Committee, and before that, the BLNA Faculty uh, Collective, and have discussions about the ways in which we can create a, a priority area within fundraising for this work. Some of the things, the tangible things that have come from that is exploration of endowed chairs, to support the work of faculty to uh, to 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 do this work as, as leaders, in addition to the commitments from the dean's office that support that work. Uh, on the grant funding side, uh, we're very fortunate to have a great partnership uh, with many individual faculty who are who have done work in the area of diversity inclusion, uh, health services researchers, community engaged research, and importantly, one of our seven research themes. Uh, the Health Equity and Translational Social Science Research Team, which is led by uh, Dr. Helena Hansen, and, uh, Interim Chair of Psychiatry, and Dr. Rochelle Dicker. Uh, that group has been uh, very um, um, uh, proactive in finding opportunities for grant cross-disciplinary grant funding, not just within the School of Medicine, but with partner schools across campus. There's a lot of promising developments there as well. I was just going to make a comment to um, one of the things that uh, BLNA and I know um, the EDI committee have talked about or asked uh, for the university to consider is something that my colleague Dr. Javier Cayigas came up with, but it's the notion of riffing off the TIF, the technology infrastructure fee, and seeing if we can get UCLA Health or UCLA um, School of Medicine for the monies that come in to have some sort of equity infrastructure fee apportion. And it's a radical idea, but we are in a brave space. So I'm just going to bring that forward again um, to think about ways that there can be structured uh, tied to this work so that yeah. it's sustainable. I just want to echo what Dr. Bath just said is that idea was a very creative idea. Uh, and one of the things I would, I guess, Offer to those of you who are uh, present physically or virtually. I, I'm not physically present, but uh, in the room. But is as you think about the things you're hearing about from us, ideas of things we've done that you think can be improved, or ideas like that that you think have promise. Uh, let us know because we can we can use your your energy and your partnership to take some of these great ideas and push them over the finish line. I would say for myself, the idea of building in. Uh, uh, an equity infrastructure fee, like Dr. Bath, uh, you know, crediting Dr. Cayegas, uh proposed, <clears throat> would be a very, very uh, pro uh, proactive and creative idea. Many of you, not to get into the weeds of school of medicine finance, but many of you are aware that there's an ongoing effort to what some have called funds flow redesign. Which, you know, for the, the the short answer is, how do we take all the resources that come into the the school and health system? and, and you know, leverage them to invest in important priorities. 
And so this would be the time to advance ideas about how we bake into funds flow redesign something like the uh, equity infrastructure fee. Dave, I don't know if you'd like to comment or you or, or if I can about the question from Judy Fortin about the Dean search. I'm happy to to chime in, but you want, may want to. Yeah, uh, let me start and then I'll I'll hand it over to to you to um to supplement everything that I forget. Um so We've worked really closely with the search firm. The we have a, a search, um, an external search firm that is working this search, and they've met with many constituents on uh, on making sure that we have all of the things that are really important functionally for the next dean. Um, what's been really exciting is they've woven that very specifically into the job description and into their recruitment efforts, and so. Uh, it's and this is a funny anecdote and an aside. I was contacted by somebody at another institution who is interested in learning more about the position. And the reason they contacted me is they said they read the job description and it was so very clear that Jedi was such a critical, essential component of this job that they thought that I would be a person that they should reach to first in order to learn more about it and 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 hear about the, the opportunity that exists at UCLA. And so there were some really structured, uh, thoughtful ways that uh, that this work has been woven into that search. Dr. Braddock, what, what else would you add? Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. The two things I, I might add are really process things. And one is that, I guess this is another part of our initial commitments with the anti-racism roadmap was uh, uh, concretizing the idea that every search committee itself must be diverse. So the composition of search committees is now uh, sort of controlled, if you will, or stipulated by policy to include uh, diversity by uh, by gender identity and by race ethnicity. In addition, there's mandatory training for all members of search committees, including this one, around uh, implicit bias training and other you know other tools that are put in place to ensure that searches are done in a way that's inclusive uh, and and, uh, uh, and and promotes equity and and uh, diversity. Um, every uh, another new relatively new practice is that uh, in these searches, including the dean search. The candidates, of course, submit a, a CV and a cover letter, but they're also asked to submit a diversity statement. So, uh, Siri apparently wanted to chime in there, so sorry about that. Um, but uh, the uh, the diversity statement provides an opportunity to really see if candidates have, have thoughtful uh, ideas and a vision for how they can advance JEDI as dean. Obviously, that's done in collaboration with all of us. And I can tell you, having been on search committees, I'm not on the Dean Search Committee, but have been on others, that, that those diversity statements are actually quite revealing. Uh, you can tell in a diversity statement, a candidate who has lived and breathed a commitment to diversity from one that's not. So it's an important addition. So those are some of the kinds of steps that are embedded in the process for the search for the new Dean. All right. It looks like our next question comes from um, Matthew Hing. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Are there any updates on the process of creating and compensating a community advisory board of local racial justice organizers and community members who can provide ongoing insight and accountability on the anti-racism roadmap? That is part of the. That is definitely part of the plan, and I think that's something that we've we've discussed. I don't know that we have an update on where that sits, but it is definitely part of our process and our thinking, and it's something that we definitely want to pursue. And so, um, anybody else would did I capture that correctly? Is there anybody else that would add anything? Mm -hmm. No, the only thing I would add, I think that that's right. I think that um, there are other examples of that with regard to search committees being able to. You know, we want to uh, include diverse voices. We also recognize that um, that um, many of the you know, same individuals will get tapped uh, for this uh, duty. And some individuals, uh, including our trainees and staff, uh, it really is hard for them to fit that work into it. So we've been working actively to uh, make sure that we are uh, you know, sort of compensating for the so-called minority tax. Uh, that's an important piece. I'd say that we've learned a lot from some of our uh, our faculty leaders who do a lot of community engaged work about the importance of demonstrating respect for the time, commitment, energy, and expertise of community members when they do participate, whether it's in uh, clinical trials, whether it's in 
planning activities around a major intervention, whether it's in education. And that's something, again, it's an idea that has not yet been actualized broadly in the School of Medicine, but the idea of having a, a philosophy that says that when we engage community members in the work of the medical school, that they ought to be compensated. Uh, that idea has been floated. It's not yet actualized, but it's another one that, you know, should you uh, have some passion around the idea, we'd love to hear from you. Excellent. All right. Uh, it looks like our next question comes from Monique. Uh, thank you so much for bringing up funds flow, Dr. Braddock. Apologies if I missed this, but can you please clarify where we should send JEDI suggestions for funds flow? Also, will there be a breakdown of how the $5 million will be spent on AR on the ARR dashboard? Let me start with the second part first and share that the um the, there's funds that come into our office into the jedi office and we're 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 allocating those in ways that are congruent with the arr so for example there is some funding that is spent from the arr uh, 5 million dollars on things like our jam council and the bruin scholars and and our compensation for our jedi leads and all of our fundamental structured things that have been moving forward in jedi have a part of arr as we as we're thinking about this work I can say that we're definitely committed to and have the rest of the funding in order to invest in the things that are really important that come through on ARR version 2.0 and where we're going next. And so uh, we'll definitely be accounting for and being able to share kind of where that funding is and where we're going with that next. But we've been very, very fortunate in that our School of Medicine has invested deeply and, and in ways that I think are unparalleled in schools of medicine in this sort of work, in our JEDI work. Um, just as an example, we pay for, for the JEDI plan, which is responsible for elevating our JEDI work across 24 departments. We've invested in a person to be compensated at 25% of their salary, uh, a, a buy down of their salary so that they can dedicate their time and energy to this important Jedi work without having to do it on nights and weekends so that it's part of their actual job. That recognition has been realized in a way that we now have people that are are, are basically chief diversity officers in their own unit and really elevating this work. And so that's a deep investment in structural change that is intended to alleviate the minority tax, but also illustrate how important this work is. You might be thinking, oh, that, that's great and fine, and I'm glad that's happening. So what? The so what of this is that there is a, an accountability symposium that is coming up on April 13th, where each of our department chairs will present on the progress that they've enjoyed over the past year. That, that, that presentation will be attended by all of the senior leadership in the School of Medicine, as well as the health system, as well as the university. Provost uh, Darnell Hunt and Vice Chancellor Anna Spain Bradley will be in attendance, as will um, Dean uh, Tracy Johnson in the, in the college. And so all of our main um, collaborators and, um, and, and those that we look to for influence and support will be in attendance, along with all of our chairs, our JEDI committee, and our JEDI leads. This is a really powerful day as our chairs will then present their progress and then at the end of that day be judged by our Jedi committee on how effective their change has been. That judgment will then go to Dean Dubinette to be used as part of chair evaluations, as well as parts of budget decisions for the following year. So we have structured ways that... that um, we're able to able to show how this ARR funding is is mobilized to create structural change in our school of medicine, which is really really profound. Yeah, I might I might just add one thing to <clears throat> to Monique's question. If you have suggestions or thoughts, you, there are several people to what uh, uh, Vice Dean McIntosh said that you could communicate with. Certainly, the you know your in your department, your Jedi leads are going to be important voices on the uh, the. Uh, the Jedi uh, Committee, uh, and also with uh, um, uh, you know, Dr. McIntosh and his team. Your department chair, uh, department chairs, particularly in clinical departments, or really in all departments, are going to be at the table uh, in those funds flow discussions. So that would be another place. But I think I would speak for uh, Dr. McIntosh to say that either one of us, him as the vice team for Jedi and my, me as the, 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 the trustee uh, executive sponsor for the Anti-Racism Roadmap, would be happy to, to hear from you. I know Dean uh, Dubinette would be happy to hear from you. So and really there are any number of channels for your ideas and advocacy. And again, if you take nothing else away from this conversation, we're inviting you to step into this work with us. 
and advocate for change and help us to work, bring creative ideas, bring energy and, and passion to advancing those, those ideas forward. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the next question, are JEDI staff available to meet with our internal health equity leaders to help align our, our guiding documents? The answer is absolutely 100% yes. And so by all means, reach out to any of us. We um, we will make sure that you get exactly the type of assistance you need. If it's around uh, health equity, it might be that we actually even partner with our colleagues across the street in the office of HETI, which is health equity, diversity, and inclusion, as they are much more closely tied to some of the the health equity measures and some of the health equity strategy for our health system. And so regardless, contact anybody in our office and we are more than happy to work with you to get to exactly what you need. Thank you, Dana, for sharing that. Um, excellent questions. Any, we, we have eight minutes left, and so we want to make sure that all of our questions are answered. We very intentionally tried to leave enough time for, for robust discussion. I don't know if um, if Julian or, or Erica, if you want to chat with us a little bit about there was an announcement made and there was uh, there's a big to do about the art in med ed project. And that's something that kind of works in concert with our ARR commitments. Do you want to share with with the community maybe a little bit about where we're at and where we're going with that and how that kind of intersects with our with our ARR commitments? I'm happy to talk about it a little bit. Um, so the, and if you're not familiar with it, the Art and Med Ed program stands for Anti-Racist Transformation and Medical Education Program. Um, it is led by uh, I can, folks at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Uh, we were lucky enough to be selected as an institution to uh, participate in an inaugural cohort. Uh, the program itself uh, originally was supposed to last three years. Uh, there might be some flexibility around that, um, as I think the program leaders are learning that um, schools are progressing at different rates, um, and some folks might be finished with kind of like the uh, scope of work that was outlined sooner, and some folks might need uh, more time. Uh, where we're at now is there are six phases in the program. Uh, we've completed the uh, first three phases, or I think two and a half phases to be exact. Um, and uh, we plan to get through the, the third uh, phase uh, within the next couple of months. Um, we've opted to uh, receive uh, a few different things going forward. So we um, have access to coaching and feedback sessions from the leaders at Mount Sinai. We have access to um, independent learning modules online. And then we also have access to this community of practice, which are uh, all of the cohort members from the other schools. Uh, the program is really designed to teach us how to lead uh, anti-racist change and develop the institution's capacity for doing so. Um, it differs from the anti-racism roadmap in that um, the ARR is more uh, content and has like particular change uh, targets. Whereas the ART program uh, is really about process and it's really about how do we um, increase motivation? How do we counter resistance? Um, how do we change kind of like the culture and some of the intangible aspects of organizational life? Uh, so that's where we are now. There are 15 uh, cohort members um, and we have a, a opportunity to recruit a few more going forward. Happy to answer any additional questions about that. Sorry. Sorry. Yep. Go ahead, Dave. So sorry, we're y'all we're we're sitting in the same room and uh, we're using three different computers, and so we're having to toggle between who has the speaker on and not. And so sorry about that. Um, perfect. Thank you so much, Julian. Uh, Erica, is there anything that you want to add to that? No. I well, I will just quote what Julian usually how he cleverly describes the difference is um, that the ARR is the what and the ART is the how. 
So really sort of like, how are we going to really have the transformation? We're learning those skills through the ART program. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for putting all of that in the chat. They're really helpful. All right. Friends and colleagues, any other questions that we can answer? I might have a, sorry, Dave. I might have a question for our team um, based off of a few messages that I got. Um, I know different departments have Department Jedi meetings, um, and they meet, you know, outside of here. Um, is this presentation, can we make it available for people? I know that um, people are interested in the task force. Um, and, you know, is that is that an opportunity for us to do, Julian, Dave? Yeah, so yes. we'll we'll work on some details. Um, the AR team does meet weekly. Um, everybody who's here, we do meet weekly. Um, we'll figure out a way to get this presentation out to everyone so that you guys can um, speak to your departments and advertise the sessions, advertise the task force, um, that contribution form. Um, and then again, that email that Dana shared um, in the chat. Um, we'd love to hear from you if you have any follow-up questions on that. Um, I see um, Daniel has a hand up. I want to. Yeah, I have a, just a quick question. And perhaps maybe even just a little bit of a comment on the current anti-racism roadmap, but thinking about just like student retention, I think one of the pieces that's kind of missing from the conversation is around economic well-being. Um, just recognizing that, you know, race and socioeconomic class are integrate, like they're tied together in this country and thinking about the ways in which any, like are there intentions to have any sort of like economic support when it comes to implementing any kind of retention program. Um, just thinking a lot about this, particularly in light of the grad student strike that's currently taking place, um, you know, North Campus. Um, the harsh reality is that many of our students are, you know, one car accident away from not being able to make rent. Um, you know, they're, and that disproportionately falls on Black, Indigenous, people of color. So I think are there any intentions to include any sort of conversations around, you know, supporting students in their basic needs? Um, as I, I think if we're gonna really try to adopt a broad view of what anti-racism looks like, we can't just stick to the interpersonal, we can't just stick to, you know, making sure that everybody has, you know, implicit bias training, but also like actually yeah. su materially supporting um, black, indigenous and people of color. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great question. I'll, I'll give a, maybe some initial thoughts. Um, you know the thing the thing that you point out is you know has so many dimensions on the dimension of just the lived experience of trainees just speaking about the different categories of trainees our our medical students our house staff uh our graduate students our postdocs um you know the the reality is, is that we've seen in the past several years that those groups have you know have had their struggle um get to the point where collective action uh was was needed to get the to get you know equity and uh, uh, at least or, or advance their um, support, we saw that a few years back. As many of you will, will know, when our uh, house staff uh, joined the uh, Council of Intern in Residents branch of uh, SEIU, uh, we're seeing that now in the uh, collective action for uh, graduate students, postdocs, TAs, etc. And uh, you know, of course, we we fully support the. The need for individuals whose voices have been uh, marginalized or minoritized to to use collective action to advance their interests, uh, and have we have all sought to to in our own work to try to support and advocate within the within the spaces that we find ourselves. The um, uh, in, in addition, I think we've we've uh, been talking more recently about about staff, and uh, you know our staff are oftentimes. Uh, you know, kind of the, the uh, invisible in these discussions about equity. We have lots of discussions about salary equity. I'm not even going to speak to that, but it's an important area. But uh, salary equity among faculty uh, is is being examined. There's there's a recent uh, major study of this a few years back that I know uh, uh, Dr. McIntosh and his team are working closely with D Dean Dubinet and the campus to address. But I would just I guess highlight staff. I think that although there've been efforts through. Uh, Human resources to do salary equity. Uh, the issues still remain about you know how how do um, people who are working hard to support all aspects of the 
the day-to-day -day running of the medical school, how do we ensure that they're that they're sort of you know um, being cared for in the sense of uh, not just fair pay, but pay that allows them to live comfortably in a very high cost area like Los Angeles. So I, I'm only pointing those things out just to, I guess, add to your question. Certainly a uh, salary for trainees, you know, either through collective bargaining, efforts that we've made in advocating to the University of California for medical student support, for instance, in our prime program, our continued efforts to, to move to more holistic ways of awarding scholarship support to medical students away from traditional metrics of merit, quote unquote, uh, such as grades or MCAT scores to more holistic reviews, a move we made several years ago that enabled us to award uh, scholarship support much more to a diverse group of students uh, than those who simply had you know, higher uh, admissions metrics. And we're very proud of that. But again, as I said at the t in my earlier remarks, we can both be uh, you know, proud of things that we've done, but also humble and committed to what you're saying, which is there's much more work ahead. And I think your question uh, couldn't come in a, at a better time. Go ahead, Erica. Oh, um, well, I wonder, and I think, um, and I don't think Dr. Uh, Moreno or Lucero are on the call now, but I believe that there's some efforts in actually doing um, social determinants screening for students, um, which would help sort of identify housing insecurity um, yeah. needs around food. And so I wonder if like we can make an institutional commitment to doing that for some of our different groups, because I know just in working with um, residents and medical students that there have been some, as uh, Daniel pointed out, uh, times where they are not stably housed. And um, people don't think, oh, a medical student can never be homeless. That's not true. You know, and so we just need to sort of spotlight some of the really real, um, you know, inequities and barriers that they may face. And maybe if we sort of are intentional about triaging for that, because it's really hard for those students to come forward and ask yeah. for help. And oh, so, 100%. And just and I to, don't know what screening would look like, sorry, and if that's the no, best no. approach. But I, I think um, that, I think that, um, well, just a couple of comments, and I know people are jumping off, but. You know, I think there have been a number of effort, efforts across the campus that are more reactive than proactive by that addressing food security and, ho and housing insecurity. I think of the food pantry effort, which we participated in and the and a, and a part of the teaching kitchen initiative at the campus level, the um, uh, a physician aid society where we I credit Dr. Lee Miller with forging a partnership so we have funding for students who are, are, are medical students who are in urgent need. But the larger part of what Dr. Bath is saying is true, which is those actions are reactive. I just heard a presentation yesterday from uh, Dr. Briggs Mollinson that within the health system, they're moving forward with screening our patients for social determinants. Uh, and you know, part of that's because it's gonna be a requirement uh, of payers uh, and joint commission, but importantly, trying to get ahead of that. And we realize that those things impact health, impact the health of our patients, certainly impact the well-being of our staff faculty, well, staff and trainees in particular. So I think we should, I agree with you. And again, ideas that people have about how we can actualize the kind of commitment that Dr. Bath is talking about would be fantastic. And we would welcome you working with all of you on that. Thank you all so much. This has been a really, really productive session today. We really appreciate everyone's engagement and involvement and a special thanks to this whole team that's been working for months and months to, to prepare an update and to take us to the next uh, step in this process. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, look forward to seeing you all in our session that will be in early next year um, where we're going through that very first update on the specifics of the roadmap. So hope to see you all there. Thank you all so much for being here. Have a great rest of your day.